agriculture.com. I'm joined today by Mark Linus, an environmentalist out of the UK who's here delivering the keynote address at Crop Connect. Uh, Mark, your topic here is GMOs are green. So what does that really mean? Well, most people, not just here in Canada, but around the world, when they think of GMOs, they think of um, environmental damage, really. The idea is that um, GMOs are somehow spreading pollution or increasing the use of chemicals in agriculture. And my pitch really is more scientific than that. I'm saying, actually, where GMOs have been deployed, they've been a force for sustainability, um, and we should push much more strongly in that direction. So the conventional assessment of needing to ban GMOs and you know everyone has to go organic. You know, I, I think there's a lot of good in organic and ecological approaches, but I would see biotechnology as a part of that, not as something which is opposed. So how do you see then, I mean, certainly for, for our audience, which is essentially conventional agriculture in Canada and the US, um, you know, GMOs are an integral part of how they farm. Um, but really when we talk big picture, sustainability, all sorts of things, it does seem to be that GMOs aren't included in that conversation. So how how are GMOs viewed as sustainable, or how, as the science sort of rounds it out, are they viewed as sustainable? Well, I think the original sin of GMOs was herbicide tolerance. So people don't like to think that weed killer is used on their crops, although of course it was already um, in larger, larger quantities probably, and using active ingredients which are worse for the environment than glyphosate, which is typically what's used in herbicide tolerant GMOs. Um, but even so, I think that association with um, the use of weed killer was what really got people against GMOs in the early years. So from the mid-1990s onwards, including myself, you know, I was very strongly opposed um, at that time, particularly with the, the sort of the technology um, roll-up with Monsanto having making the glyphosate and making the herbicide tolerant seeds. So all of that stuff. But, you know, that's not really... I mean, that's still pretty much the largest trait application of GMOs, but there's so much in terms of insect resistance now, which has drastically reduced the use of insecticides around the world. Um, disease resistant, there's now drought tolerance, there's nitrogen efficiency. There's lots of traits now coming through using biotechnology, GMOs in particular, uh, which, are, uh, which really do promise to increase the, the environmental efficiency and sustainability of agriculture. And if we take this sort of simplistic, like, you know, anti-GMO approach, then, then we, we can't have these environmental benefits. So how do we then bridge that sort of this gap between, uh, because obviously there's people on the extreme that, you know, um, I don't know that you could ever convince them otherwise, and that's fine, but, you know, I found through our work and through um, the consumers that I speak with and through, through real agriculture that, you know, there's many people who are sort of in the middle and who are kind of bombarded on all sides by really scary images and sharing on Facebook and all these sorts of, you know, things that just s sort of re reiterate over and over how dangerous all these things are. So how do we sort of, as a conventional industry or even, you know, as an organic industry, that's, that um, how do we sort of balance that? Well, the scary stuff is difficult because that's, I think, what really upsets people. And yes, there's lots of, you know, Photoshop montages of corn with fangs and, you know, deformed babies and stuff like that, which are purported to be associated with GMOs. Of course, there's no, the thing is, there's no scientific evidence at all for that. There isn't a single substantiated case of any health impact after 15, 20 years of research and hundreds of different scientific papers published. And there's a scientific consensus on this, which is as strong as in any comparable area, like, you know, I would say the existence of global warming. So to have environmentalists, this is what I point out, so have people who say they're environmentalists, who say you've got to listen to the scientists on climate change, um, but you've got to ignore the scientists on biotechnology. Now that's an inconsistent position. So my baseline is let's take this, the overwhelming scientific evidence on both these issues and then work, work forward from that. So now when we're talking in the, the scientific side though, I, I find we're also talking about something, like you said, it's very scary, it gets very emotional. Mm. How do we with, you know, if we've got good science and we understand it and perhaps the person we're discussing this with understands it, how do you get past the emotional side of it? Well, it's very difficult because opposition to GMOs is a very much a values-based emotive issue. Um, and people who oppose GMOs generally do so not because they understand what, what GMOs are uh, at any technical level. Um, almost universally they don't. Um, but because they identify with things that they oppose, like industrialized monoculture. So I think 
those who use conventional agriculture on a large scale, such as here in Manitoba, have a, really have a duty to explain why they're doing what they're doing, why they farm in the way that they do. You know, why do they need to use um, any, any level of chemicals? Why do they need to use these huge, great machines? You know, what are the environmental impacts? Is it really possible to go back to a situation where kind of everything's done by hand and everything's organic? If not, why not? You know, and so there's all these bigger issues which I think need to, ex need to be explained. And to a large extent, the farming industry hides its unsustainability. Which, and there are real issues there in terms of nitrogen use and greenhouse gases and all sorts of things, and not, not to mention biodiversity loss. Um, and also it sells itself on natural, you know, like butter producers, you just have a picture of one cow in a big field, you know, it's not like that. So then the, the reality when it does hit people, I think shocks and scares them. So I, I, I do point to the farming industry and I think it has to do a better job, not just in terms of practice, but also in terms of communications and helping people understand how farming is done in the real world. Okay. So um, when you sort of, let's say on the other side, so as an environmentalist who did oppose biotechnology and GMOs, what, what was your sort of biggest misconception that you've sort of come around to? Well, it, it's very political. So I think one of the reasons why a lot of anti-GMO campaigners feel the way that they do isn't really anything to do with the environment. It's to do with this kind of identification with big corporations. You know, this is where the name Monsanto comes up all the time. Um, even amongst people, or especially amongst people who've got no idea actually what Monsanto does, what its business model is, who its customers are, anything like that. They just think they know that it's some kind of evil corporation. Um, and, and GMOs are sort of umbilically entwined with that. Um, so, and you can't really tackle that head on. You, know, you can't demystify these, these issues directly. So, I, you know, I, tried, I try and go around and take a different tack and, and reframe these issues and point to some of the uses of GMOs in developing countries, primarily in Africa and um, uh, Southeast Asia, which are tackling, potentially tackling malnutrition, um, diseases in, in crops, which if you can deal with them through biotechnology means that these farmers don't have to use chemicals, um, all of these kinds of things. So having a kind of let's ban GMOs approach actually is going to make life worse potentially for millions of people. And once you can start to evaluate these on a case-by-case -case basis, and at least you can say, right, I don't like hopes or tolerance, but I do like golden rice, which is going to save a lot of children's lives, you know, then at least you can have a sensible conversation. What's not sensible, what's irrational and illogical is to say I oppose the use of an entire technology irrespective of what its impacts are. Okay. All right. Well, looking forward to today's keynote, and uh, I know our audience will be uh, interested to hear this, and, and uh, I know certainly for a lot of the conversations, a lot of the editorials we do, I think, uh, as an industry in agriculture and farming, we're struggling with that communication piece, that piece of the reality of farming, um, and sort of demystifying some of the, some of the uh, things that we do on the farm and how food makes it from the farm to your plate. So, exactly right. But it has, so to, be, but it has to be both, you see. It has to be the reality as well as the communications. It can't just yes. be a PR job, and I think that's crucial yeah. for people to understand. And I think it has to be reality, and this is where sort of I struggle at times, is that there, you know, as an industry, um, you know, there are aspects of agriculture that to an outsider who doesn't understand what's going on may look painful for an animal or may look less pretty or, um, you know, big giant machines and, you know, and these sorts of things that, right. you know... Right, but if you want cheap food in the shops, then that's what you have to accept. And, you know, there are trade-offs here. And I think people have to, pe people are able to make sensible decisions and understand trade-offs, but you have to give them the right information. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, my right. pleasure, Mark. Pleasure.